Living as a godly person here on earth during this time before eternal glory isn't easy. In the first place, we're not perfect or complete just yet. Uh, our fallen souls are tempted to do things that we shouldn't do and to neglect things we know we ought to do. Second, we live in a world that's saturated by distortions and bad examples to follow. It's filled with theories based on bad information and generations of excuse making. Uh, we're urged to run like lemmings after everybody else's values and deeds. Uh, there's a battle we need to fight not only against what's around us, but also against what's in us. So, how do we get the victory? Uh, or, or even know that we're doing the right thing? Well, God didn't redeem us and then leave us to figure it out by ourselves or to win the battles on our own. God gave us His written word. It was recorded long ago to guide us and to comfort us. And it was preserved providentially by the blood of martyrs so that it's here for us today. And then it was translated into our languages by scholars gifted by God and made available to us so we can read it and study it and learn it. And then God gave us a living Savior in the Holy Spirit. And they help and empower us to live by the promises and principles in that book that we call the Bible. And he also regenerates his children and gives them faith to trust in that word. But there are enemies of God's plan out there. Uh, Satan struck us first in Eden. Uh, there uh, we were made defective by that original fall into sin. But once we're redeemed, it doesn't mean that the enemy is going to leave us alone. Way back in the first century A.D., there were some who came to Galatia to derail the gospel if they could. But God raised up the Apostle Paul to write this letter to expose their attack. Uh, God preserved that letter for us so we could read it today because the basic principles still apply. Now, in chapter 3 of the letter, Paul gets right to the issue. Let me take us to the text here. We'll look at the first verse of Galatians chapter 3. There he says, Foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Well, someone was deceiving them, luring them down the wrong path. That word translated bewitched in most of our translations is baskeno. Uh, it means to draw someone to follow after them by deceit or by impressing them in some way. Uh, these deceivers weren't atheists or pagans, they were religious leaders, the Judaizers. Uh, they claimed to be Christians, but were diluting the gospel by combining it with a, a confused view of God's law. The Judaizers misused the purpose of God's law that he gave to Israel because they misunderstood it. They failed to see how God's law always pointed toward the one God would send to die in the place of his people, the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah. Uh, they wanted to ignore the changes brought about by the Savior's life and death. Now, from the time of Abraham to the resurrection of Christ, circumcision was a sign of belonging to God's covenant people. Only the males were circumcised to illustrate the representative nature of God's covenants. Uh, the males represented the families that they would one day lead. But after our Savior finished the work of God by, that he promised in Eden, baptism became the new sign of belonging to God's covenant people. Uh, both genders received the sign because Jesus is now our representative fulfilling the promises. And then from the time of Moses to the resurrection of Jesus, Passover was the ultimate sacrifice. It represented the death of the coming Messiah, what he would do. A lamb was slain in place of the death of the firstborn of each family when they were held captive back in Egypt. And after the work of our Savior, the Lord's Supper represents the final sacrifice for sin. Jesus, the Lamb of God, was slain in place of that eternal death that we all deserve. So to continue to require the Passover is a denial that his purpose was fulfilled in Christ. All the ritual cleansings and the Levitical laws were set aside when the real cleansing took place. Israel was no longer going to be the exclusive covenant community of God. Instead of uh, uh, making it out just for the descendants of Jacob, now the non-Jews, the Gentiles, would be included. But the Judaizers were pressuring the Christians in Galatia to force the Gentile converts to submit to the now fulfilled Jewish ceremonial laws. And so Paul asked the believers in Galatia to explain why they are being taken in by the Judaizers. This is what he talks about in verses 2 through 5. Let me put those up on screen for us. <clears throat> Here Paul says, This only I want to learn from you. 
before whose eyes Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law? Or does he do it by the hearing of faith? This is what Paul wrote in that next chapter of Galatians. The Galatians had seen the power of Christ in the lives of the apostles and they had experienced it in their own lives too. So pointed out the, Paul pointed out the absolute foolishness of being deceived by these other teachings. The life they found in Christ didn't come by rituals. It came by the message they received by faith in what God had been illustrating in these rituals. They learned that Jesus was the sacrifice all the other sacrifices pointed toward. They received the Holy Spirit sent from Jesus Christ and God the Father. And this uh, new life wasn't found in, in the work of priests who served before the gospel came to them. This passage confuses a lot of people. Uh, confusion is one of the primary tactics of the enemy of God's plan. And the most common targets of confusion are these two key ideas of law and faith. Well, first, there's a lot of confusion about the law of God. The word law itself is a very general term. Uh, it's used generally in our day-to-day -day use of the word law in our conversations uh, in our world today. Uh, we pass civil laws to, to punish crime and to preserve public safety. Uh, these apply general principles to specific situations. So, for example, to keep our roads and pedestrians safe, we have traffic laws. To protect our lives and possessions, we have various criminal laws and contract laws. Nations agree on certain international laws to protect uh, their borders and their security. And sometimes we talk about the law of gravity or Newton's laws of motion. Well, these are mathematical descriptions of how physical things behave. They follow rules God built into his creation. And as we confirm them, we call them laws. And there's also general principles as we speak of as if they were laws. We talk about the law of supply and demand in economics. And uh, we also have various laws of sociology. And, and every field has certain basic principles like that that are so well established, they call them laws. The Bible sometimes uses the word law in these same basic general ways. But you have to look at the context in each case to see how the word's being used in that particular verse. When it mentions God's law, it may be about God's commandments or some principles that work in his creation. For example, there's a general principle, in fact, a couple general principles described in Romans chapter 7. In Romans 7:23, Paul mentions these conflicting laws he found at work in him. He referred to the lust of his body uh, and the principles at work in his mind. Uh, he calls them laws or principles at odds with one another. Uh, earlier in the same chapter, Paul tells how the moral laws of God exposed his sin. As an example, he mentions God's commandment against coveting the wrong things, coveting things he hasn't chosen to give you. These laws are moral behaviors God says are good. Uh, the violation of them is sin. But Paul is not saying that all of the laws in the Bible or the principles of the Bible have stopped applying to all humans. Uh, these revealed general principles were built into the universe and into our human nature from the very beginning. Sinful things in the Old Testament were not now becoming good and uh, good things becoming bad. Uh, he can't mean that before the Ten Commandments it was okay to covet things God didn't choose to give you. Uh, it doesn't mean that before Mount Sinai all the other Nine Commandments weren't in effect either. It's always been wrong to worship another God, to make images of the true spirit being God, to use his name carelessly or to, to labor on creation Sabbath or to defy God's appointed authorities, uh, to murder, to commit adultery, to steal, or to lie. Uh, here in Galatians 3, he's talking about the regulations of the Levitical codes given to Israel at Mount Sinai. That's very clear when we look at verse 17. We'll get to that uh, in a few studies. But there he says that the law he's talking about didn't come until 430 years after Abraham. That's when God gave the Levitical regulations to Israel after the Exodus, these ceremonial laws that pointed toward the redemption we'd one day have in Christ. The works of the law that Paul's talking about 
are performing these rituals, these sacrifices given to Israel by Moses. The ritual laws of the priesthood were redemptive, not moral. They were there uh, in order to help Israel anticipate the coming sacrifice of Christ. They pointed to uh, the solution to the sin problem, uh, the problem that the moral laws were there to reveal and had revealed all the way from the beginning of man's creation. And they made God's people stand, in, stand out as a holy nation, uh, prefiguring the special nature of Christ's church. They had to do certain rituals, cleansings, and certain dietary regulations and all. And that was done so that they would be marked out as a special people. But secondly, Paul makes a contrast between the works of the law and the hearing of faith. Now the word faith is the normal word that's often simply translated by the word trust. In Greek it's the word pistis. You'll find that it's used for trusting in all kinds of things. When you have faith, it's always faith in something. Faith always has an object that you trust in. In this case, the object of our trust should be God's promises and his revealed truth. Now before Christ's birth, God's redeemed uh, people, his believers, trusted in the promises of a coming Messiah, a coming Savior, a Redeemer. They didn't know a lot of the details, but they trusted that God would provide for them, and the sacrifices were to prefigure that. Uh, after his death, believers trust in Christ's finished work, how he fulfilled all those promises on the cross. So in every era of history, Saving faith is trusting in God's promise that the Messiah would remove sin. We're redeemed by his work, uh, never by our own acts and accomplishments. We don't need a priesthood to do things beyond what Christ already accomplished for us. We don't have to worry that we haven't done enough to get our way to heaven if we have to earn it. Jesus did all that for us. That's the gospel, the good news. So now, we live by faith in that finished work. We live as if we really trust God for everything he says in his word. Uh, we, we tell the truth. We act kindly because God tells us that's always the best thing to do. Uh, and by grace, we believe it and we strive to obey his loving counsel. A biblical faith is a trust in the things that God has made known. His law in that general sense. His moral law exposes that we're lost in sin without hope, except, of course, in the Savior. And it shows us how then we need to be so thankful that God has redeemed us who don't deserve it. And a study of the ritual law shows how God's substitution would, would be taking place in the Messiah, how he would come to pay the price for their sins. And so we don't keep those rituals and sacrifices now as if the Messiah hadn't come. Uh, there's no act of the church or ritual or sacrifice we can take part in that takes away our sins. Uh, it was all accomplished in Jesus Christ just as God had promised. And there's a wonderful blessing in this implanted faith. If our confidence that what God said is true and always right, it gives us a sure hope. As God's children, we confidently trust that what God says and therefore what we, uh, what we trust in is important for us and we want to live therefore by his promises. Trusting and obeying are the results of God's grace. They aren't the cause of it. So when we trust in God's word about the substitute death of Jesus for our sins, we're given all the comforts and assurances uh, that uh, we could ever expect that God's promises and his gracious covenant are true. Now today, the Judaizers are long gone, but the confusion is still with us. Fallen hearts still want to believe that a person can earn God's favor by his own efforts. That's the very heart of Satan's strategy. He wants to confuse God's truth and promise, just as the Judaizers did in old Galatia. Uh, when you worry about doing enough to earn salvation, then you're denying that you've fallen into sin. You can't do that. The Bible says that when you fell in Adam, you lost all desire and ability to truly glorify God. You, yourself and, and your benefits are always the real reason that motivates you. And it makes it clear uh, that the debt is so great that no one can pay it off. You can't keep God's law perfectly if you take it at face value. You then would deny the very reason that Jesus came to die in your place if you thought you could earn salvation. Then the suffering and death of our Savior was just a frivolous object lesson or some example of humility and nothing more. These poisonous teachings contradict everything the Bible says. People have always tried to make up a religion that earns God's forgiveness. And that's what Paul here calls a false religion, a replacement 
for the true gospel. Uh, the fallen heart thinks that by doing charitable things it might remove guilt. It doesn't. Some believers uh, think that by simply partaking of the sacraments it sort of magically takes away their sins. But that's not what the sacraments mean at all. Others think that their decision is what convinces God to save them. In reality, uh, that just evidences God's grace at work. It's not what makes it happen. But like the Judaizers of ancient times, these false ways claim to be Christian. But they're the exact opposite. They trust in human works and human effort to make them righteous in God's eyes. It's not by the works of the law that we become Christians. It's when the promises of God revealed in the law are heard and trusted and the heart transformed by the work of Christ. That's a wonderful work. And it's done by grace all by itself. But there's another side. Some add obedience to the law, uh, to faith in the gospel. And so they, they go the exact uh, others that, I mean, the, these that I was just talking about add obedience to the law, to the gospel. But others go to the exact opposite extreme. And they think that you can have faith while rejecting all of God's laws. And that's not what's taught here either. Paul isn't telling the Galatians that all of God's laws are now outdated and expired. Uh, he doesn't uh, promote faith in some general optimism that replaces God's moral commandments. He's not saying that the entire Old Testament only had value to the Jews. Some undefined idea of love is all we need. No, love is nothing if we don't define it. And it's defined in Scripture by the law of God. He's reminding the Galatians here that the Bible never taught that their salvation was by the law. And he points out that the law shows what's right and that you can't do it. You can't walk by that path because you're lost. The law exposes sin and the rituals point the way to the sacrifice of Christ. That's what it always did. And that's what God still does when his law is rightly understood. So without God's word exposing sin and promising the Savior, your faith isn't in the right thing. <clears throat> uh, the faith uh, that God's grace stirs in our hearts is a trust in everything that God has revealed. But that means you need to really trust all that God says in his word. You trust that his way to manage your home and family is the best way for them. You trust that his moral principles are the only right guide for your thoughts and even in choosing the entertainment that you fill your mind with. You trust his economic principles for how you do your work and manage your money. You trust in his organization of the church as the right way to worship and to grow as a spiritual family. You trust uh, his directions for your personal life. And so you make time to seriously uh, you know, bow your head in prayer and study the scriptures. Uh, you take worship seriously at every level. You worship him alone in your thoughts every day, all through the day. You worship him as a family when you can get together and do that. I think it should be done daily as a family. And when you're called to worship as a congregation, you're there and you're paying attention and taking part consciously, sincerely. Real faith means that you have faith in God's promises as the only way that your guilt can be forgiven. Now, Satan wants you to think that uh, you need to fix your guilt by your own good deeds and efforts or by the efforts of priests and some rituals that you go through. Instead, you need to trust completely in the work of Christ alone to make you right with God. Now, many of your friends and neighbors are deceived and, and think that they have to earn their forgiveness. You have a liberating gospel, good news, and that can set them free and change their lives. You know enough to point them to God's truth and to rescue them from false religion. Don't let them put their eternal hope in lies that just advance Satan's agenda. You need to be humbly persistent with them as you live for Christ and explain what he's accomplished when you have a proper opportunity to do so. I think one of the best ways is to invite them to come to church and worship with you. Become part of the church activities and grow as part of your church family where they'll be exposed to the gospel, seeing it active in the lives of other people and hearing it preached and taught. And I believe you need to pray for your neighbors and let them know that you really care for them. It's not by cathedrals and rituals, rallies, or even personal efforts that anyone enters the kingdom of Christ. It's by a humble but sincere trust in the finished work of the Savior. Uh, this is the foundation of real biblical Christianity. And it's, it's our job and calling to be an agent of God on earth, uh, agents of change in the lives of people. Uh, we need to trust in the promises of Scripture and live as if we really trust what God says there. 
Well, there's a lot of religious people trying real hard to get right with God. But they don't really know God or what He's promised them. They go to some church, they read the Bible now and then, uh, they try to do good things and they pray. But the good news, the gospel, is that uh, though God requires perfection, Jesus Christ came to be perfection in our place. Yet when the Holy Spirit moves us to trust in this payment for our sin, it also changes us inside, helps us to move toward that perfect goal. It enables believers to do what they, uh, what they otherwise couldn't do in the past. They can really begin to enjoy life, understanding how it all fits together in God's plan. They begin to see Him at work. And when things happen around them that trouble them, they understand it, it's, it's God's providence, but now what, how does He teach me to handle it? And we trust in the principles he gives us in his word as we face the challenges of day-to-day -day life. Even through those hard times, we can rest in the assurances that our living Savior is there with us. Our church going, Bible reading, praying, and serving take on a whole new and truly rewarding dimension. It's not our efforts that bring the victory over sin and over its depressive consequences. It's the finished work of the Savior that does it all. Living God's way is the only method that works for living here in God's world. And it begins by resting in the Savior's work of grace, rather than by any rituals, choices, or rules on your behalf. The gospel is really liberating. Don't neglect that vital fact in your life. Don't keep it a secret from the people around you. Don't be like the foolish Galatians who are so easily deceived by convincing popular teachings. Put your trust in God's promises. Do it through Christ. And bravely and consistently live the way He tells you to.